Okay, so we begin recording and hello everyone. I am going to ask you to mute yourself um, if you're not speaking right now. And um, if at the end you'd like to ask questions, there will be time for that and you can go ahead and unmute yourself at that point. So my name is Adria Katz. I'm really happy to have you guys here. Um, I work at the Multicultural Arts Center, um, as does Zoe, who's also on this call, and we are thrilled to have Lindsay Rothrock here with us today. And she is gonna speak about her, um, about the show that she has in our gallery right now. So um, before we start, I'm gonna start with a, an acknowledgement of the land. Uh, I am in Massachusetts right now. Many of you are representing lots of different areas. Um, so I am gonna share a digital land acknowledgement that was written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb. Um, you can find out more about her. We'll drop a link in the chat. Um, she's an artist and she wrote the land acknowledgement for the digital space. Um, and so I'm going to, in gratitude, uh, share what she has written. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology structures and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonialization, and allyship. So with that in mind, welcome to uh, Lindsay. And um, as I said before, we're gonna hear a little bit about her. She's gonna share some images and some of her process and her work. And then there will be time for a Q&A at the end. If you have a burning question as we're going, feel free to drop it in the chat and we're gonna be moderating the chat and we'll make sure to bring it up when there's space to do so. Or at the end, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your questions or raise your hand and we can make sure that there's, uh, that there's space for you to ask those questions as, as there's time at the end. Um, so just a little bit about Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay's a fine art photographer whose work explores themes of companionship by examining the fault lines between what is seen and what is assumed. The work calls the viewers to imagine honest, compassionate relationships and a more harmonious, just existence. Rothrock's work has been featured in juried exhibitions in St. Paul, Minnesota and Wheaton, Illinois. Wheaton College presented her with the non-ward and upward first place award in 2018. She also held solo exhibitions in Buzzwell Library in Wheaton, Illinois and the Multicultural Arts Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And she's taught photography classes. Am I gonna say this right? You may have to help me, Lindsay. <laughs> Moya Bamba. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And Ayachucho, Peru. Ayachucho. Ayachucho. Okay, thank you. And she lives in Madison, Wisconsin right now. Um, and we're going to drop a link to her uh, website so you can check out more about her. Um, although you'll learn a lot of that today, hopefully. And today we're going to discuss uh, With, which is Lindsay's show that's currently here at the Multicultural Arts Center Gallery and it explores gender and place through two series. One is femininity, masculinity, and another one is te ubicas. Um, and we'll also drop a link in the chat about, uh, or to link you to the virtual gallery so you can see it if you haven't gotten a chance to look at it yet, or check it out after the show when you have a little bit more of an understanding of, of the work and um, the process behind it. All right, Lindsay, anything I missed or you wanna add? <laughs> I think that sounds like a good introduction. Thank you, Adria. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to just ask you a couple questions, speak on them, and then, and then we'll turn it over to you so you can share some of the work. So just to start us off, um, can you just give us a little background about yourself and the type of photography you enjoy doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like Zoe said, or like Adria said, sorry, I I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin. I um, love photography. I currently work in tech. Um, so I 
also have kind of a math brain. I majored in math in college um, and minored in fine art, but photography is what I really love. And yeah, I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to be sharing my work with you. Awesome. How about your trajectory as a photographer? What's your, what's your growth and development been as, you, as you've explored photography? Mm -hmm. I have always loved photography. When I was little, I often borrowed my mom's camera. She had a clunky digital point and shoot Nikon um, that I coveted immensely. <laughs> and yeah, I loved it. Eventually my parents gave me a camera of my own. And after that, I started saving up to buy. First I bought like a little Canon point and shoot and then I eventually bought myself a DSLR, um, saving all my money from a summer job in high school. <laughs> and I was really fortunate to go to a school that had some really awesome art classes. So I got to take photo classes while I was in high school and I got to learn how to use a dark room and develop film. And um, it was a really nurturing environment to learn how to be creative and like, what does it mean to be a photographer? And then I continued that in college. Um, I came into college not knowing what I'd major in, but I knew that I wanted to have a photography minor. And I went through many iterations of what I wanted to major in, finally settled on math, but the photography minor was constant. And um, yeah, I interned, my one internship in college was a documentary photo position with a nonprofit in Peru. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about my Teubica series. And then I moved to Madison, got my tech job, and have been working on projects on the side. Awesome. That's super cool. Yeah. I'm curious more about who those, those mentors were along the way and the people who taught you in those different classes and your inspiration. Um, but maybe I'll speak more about that. Uh, what what do you love about photography? What appeals to you about that medium? And what's your, like, who are sources of inspiration for you and photographers you look to mm. and have influenced you? I love a lot about photography. I, I love that it's a way of expressing what you see and the way you see it and sharing it with someone. That can be so difficult to do with words, right? To try and communicate like, oh, well, this is how I see this, or like, this is where I'm coming from. Like that can be so, it can be so difficult to communicate kind of how you see things um, with words. And I love that photography gives me a medium for expressing myself in a way that's really clear. Um, and it allows me to explore really complex ideas um, in a way that I think speaks really well or even better than what I could say verbally or what I could write out. Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. It was like, a, I, I think that we all learn in different ways and communication is written is only one way that we can communicate. And so a, a visual image can, can, it says a thousand words, I guess, <laughs> but that does, that's really profound. Um, how about with, can you tell us about the inspiration for this show? Um, and what's your mission in, in the show? What are you trying to accomplish through it? Yeah, my inspiration, the inspiration for the show came in college. I had an art history class with a professor named Dr. Milliner and he was great. He was a genius. I found him incredibly difficult to follow because he was constantly being like this artist, this artist, this artist, also this artist, and then this artist over there. And it was amazing. And I was also like, I have no idea, like, what you're going to test me on because you've just mentioned like five people and it's been 30 seconds but he used to project art um as he was talking about it and he'd like walk back and forth and like stand in the art and lecture at us from like within the painting which i thought was really interesting because it was he like the painting interacts with the person who's standing in front of it and it like it makes this digital non-physical thing suddenly seem very physical because it's folding across the body and there's shadows and there's um like it warps as it as your depth changes um and i found that really fascinating the way you can like actually layer meanings on top of um physical objects especially people i find people really interesting to photograph um and 
ever since then, I really like in that class, I really wanted to photograph like, well, what would happen if I photographed like a man on top of a woman? And like, what would that say? Or like, what would it happen if I photographed, like I projected um, like a person of one race onto a person of another race? And like, what would that say? And like, what if they were nudes? What if they were wearing clothes and all of these different things? Um, so the inspiration for both of the series really came from Dr. Milliner in Art History 101. <laughs> That is so helpful for me to contextualize. That's so interesting because I think the technique is so is very cool, and I can just see how you looking at it with an artist's eye, you would say, "Wow, something really interesting is happening here. It's not just a guy walking in front of a projector. It's yeah, it can it can mean a lot more than that." Wow, cool. Um, all right. Well, I would love to uh, ask you to segue into some photos you want to share. Um, and talk a little bit about what's significant about those ones and um, yeah, what will just narrate a little bit for us uh, what you see in the work that we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Let awesome. me, let me share my screen. Okay. So can people see my screen? Thumbs up. Cool. Um, I, let me finagle my little zoom sidebar. Okay, so I have a series of work up in the gallery and I'm gonna talk about some of the work from my Teubica series, which is a larger piece, like a larger body of work. And then I'm going to talk about both the femininity and masculinity series, which are two series that make up the Femininity Masculinity Project. Um, so I'm going to start with masculine. I'm going to start with femininity. Um, so if I hit F, can you all see my screen still? Can you see the image full, full size? Looks good. Cool. Sounds good. So these images are, I made them about a year ago, and they're images, they're kind of what really grew out of that experience with my art history professor in Art 101. Um, I was really curious to see what would happen if I projected male bodies onto female bodies and then female bodies onto male bodies. And I was thinking a lot about how our reactions to those two different things are different. Like if you see a woman projected onto a man, why do you emotionally react to that differently than if you see a man projected onto a woman? And I wanted to think about the ways we project assumptions onto people that we meet. Um, so if you meet me, you will probably be like, you look like a woman, you know? Um, and with that gendering of the people we meet, there are all these assumptions that we subconsciously or not subconsciously bring to the table. Um, there are a lot of assumptions like women are probably more inclined to try and people please and more nurturing and really want people to get along and <clears throat> care about appearances more and are probably cleaner and like all of these different things that can be true of men or women, um, but we've gendered our society such that there are assumptions that we place upon women. And then with men, it's the same thing. You see a man and you're like, oh, he probably wants to be tough and he wants to be strong and he wants to be like the defender of his family or the provider for his family or blah, 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 um, different things like that. <clears throat> and I really wanted to think about the ways that is harmful and the ways that that allows or disallows women and men to move around in the world. Um, so with those things in mind, I'm gonna flip through some of these images and then I'm gonna pause and like talk about a couple of them.
So that's the femininity series. And then we can go, we'll go through the masculinity series fairly quickly as well. So those are the femininity and masculinity images. Um, I wanted to think about, while we're looking at these, I want us to be thinking about the ways we value different gendered values, right? So when you assume a woman like wants to be more gentle or wants to be more kind and a man wants to be like brave and tough and whatever, um, if you flip those, if you look at a man and he is really gentle and nurturing and kind and sweet and just wants everyone to get along versus a woman who wants to be like tough and like self-sufficient and provide for herself and um, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's a disparity in how we, as like the church culture that I grew up in, as a culture at large, treats those two individuals. Um, women are often encouraged to be more like men because men are the standard. Like women are encouraged to like be tough and be able to provide for themselves and, you know, like not be too emotional. And, um, and there's a deep misogyny in that, right? Where you're telling women like, here are the values that are associated with you. Um, but if a man is like that, then we call him weak and like, you know, like he, he's more effeminate and like maybe he's not all that masculine and that's a bad thing. But women should all want to be more like men because, you know, you that's, that's the standard. And obviously I'm making sweeping statements and generalizations. This isn't true like universally across the board. Um, but in my experience, that is how I've felt about gender quite a bit. Um, and that's what I've experienced. And that's what I've seen. Um, and I really wanted to challenge that with this series and think about, um, yeah, the disparities and how we treat each other and the ways we interact um, and the conflict that that can cause and the tension that is there when we're, we're whole beings. Like we can be strong and gentle and tough and self-sufficient and dependent on other people. And all of that can go together and it shouldn't matter um, whether you're a woman or a man, like those things are all good qualities. And I want to, I want to think about those nuances and the ways that we interact with each other. So these, this um, series you'll notice is framed by these two bodies, their arms are crossed, they're looking in, it's a sort of typically judgmental stance, right? Um, but if you take a look at the photos, you'll notice that the faces are facing towards us. They're not facing inward towards these two images in the middle. They're actually facing out towards the viewer. And I want us to think about what that means with that posture of judgment. Um, and these two body types where like the woman is very skinny, right? And she is very slim and it only takes up a fraction of the man but the man like has a belly and like what does that mean and what are the standards that we hold for men's and women's bodies um but what is also what does it mean that they're looking out at us and not in at these two images that are in between them um yeah i don't have a lot to say about this one i think it's really beautiful i love the hair that's on that's projected onto the side of his face um And then this one is very complex and very powerful for me. Um, 
I've talked with a lot of people who are like, whoa, like, wait, when this, when they first see it, they're like, wait, hold on, what's going on? There's like shadows. And then there's like one person, and then there's another person. Um, and I like it because I think it's visually striking. And I also think it asks a lot of questions, right? Women are often silenced by men. Um, what does it mean for a man to hold, to silence himself, to place his own hands over his mouth? What does it mean for a woman to place her hands over the mouth of a man and to silence a man? Um, what does it mean that she's looking away from us and he's looking at us um, in this act of silencing, of not speaking submission and strength? There are a lot of conflicting ideas here. And that's something that I really explore, I seek to explore with my work is I want to bring those ideas that and hold them in tension um, so that we can start seeing how they interact with each other and how that shapes how we interact with each other. And then if I didn't explain before, femininity is a woman projected onto a man. Um, so that's what's going on in these images. And then masculinity is a man projected onto a woman. And these images um, are much more personal for me because I am, I am a woman. Um, yeah, so these two at the end, something else that you'll notice is I really like the idea of same, same, but different, contrasting two images that are very similar, um, but that have slight differences because I want us to think about the differences that are in them. So these two images that bookend the series and then also these two images that bookend or that are in the middle of the series, um, you'll notice are very similar. And this one and this one, they're both, I, I think of these ones as dancing images. Um, I, this one, especially when I was making it, I felt like I was dancing with the projected image. Um, and it was a really beautiful experience. And this, this image, I think, speaks to what I would hope for our experiences with each other, the way we, and the ways we treat each other, we I would hope that we live in a way that is beautiful and in a way that respects the ways that we're different and the ways that we're the same. Um, this image, I think, represents a lot more of the reality, right? Where there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of grace, um, but there's also some violence. You'll notice that his hand is grasping the woman's left arm um, and he's looking down, she's looking up, so there are these contrasting ideas. Her hands are open, his hands are clenched. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to the tensions that women experience, particularly when they're in relationship with men. With these, these again, these two are the same, same, but different, very similar um, poses. The same image was projected, but they express different moods. Um, so this image on the left, um, she's looking down, he's looking out. It's a much more relaxed pose that she's in. Um, her shoulders are down, she's not tense. Um, and then in this one, she's much more tense. Her body language is much more closed, but she's also looking up and there's much more, I think there's more pride in this image, but I think there's also more defensiveness too, right? Um, and that's also a barrier to open and honest companionship and relationship. And then the center one, um, I want us to just sit with for a couple of seconds um, and then I'll share some thoughts on it. So this one is, my mom told me it was her least favorite because I look scared. Um, and I appreciate that from my mom because I know that she looks out for me. Um, this one means a lot to me. I think it 
speaks really clearly about a lot of the disparities between the ways we allow women and men to exist in the world. Um, the man is like very free and easy, shirtless, very powerful. Um, and the woman is not so much, right? Um, it's also Good Friday. I am a Christian, so Good Friday is meaningful for me. And you'll notice that the hand um, is pierced over the stomach. Um, and I think about stigmata and the suffering that goes along with that. Um, stigmata are the wounds of Christ, for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, yeah, I think that I find this image to be very powerful. I know that I've spoken with folks who find it to be uncomfortable, and I think that is good because with the series of femininity and masculinity, I didn't want to be like, look, like women and men always get along and it's great. I wanted to really think about the ways we relate to each other and the tensions that um, we encounter when we are encountering each other. So those are femininity and masculinity. Um, and those are the two initial projects that really sprung out of me seeing my professor pacing back and forth in front of his projector. Um, we'll move on now to Te Ubicas, which is a series that I have recently been working on. Excuse me. Um, a lot of folks have asked me what Te Ubicas means, and I've realized that I haven't documented that anywhere. Um, and Te Ubicas is a, a Spanish phrase that um, directly translated means do you locate yourself? And it's a really casual way of asking like, hey, do you know where you are? And I said that I'd return to when I was interning in Peru um, as a photographer. And so now is when I'm going to do that. Um, it was between my junior and senior year of college. I got this internship. I was connected through a professor at my school. I like had no idea what the internship was. I had like almost no information when I went down. Um, and in my mind, I was like, oh, like, it'll be great. I'm going to like stay with the host family and I'm going to get to know like Lima because that's where I was going. Um, and I'll like make friends and like learn about Lima and I'll be there for two months and it'll be great. And then I showed up and I had my like two days of orientation and then they immediately sent me somewhere else. <laughs> they were like, great. So now you're going to go spend a week at like this other place with this other family. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like they are an organization with a lot of offices kind of all over the place in Peru. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like I'll do that. That sounds fun. Um, so I like went, I was gone for a week. I came back to Lima and then they were like, I was in Lima for a week. And then they were like, great, now you're going to go somewhere else. And that was pretty much the whole summer. Um, at one point I added it all together and I think I took 13 flights that summer because I was just flying all over the place um, and it, <clears throat> it was really cool because I got this survey of Peru I got to like see a lot of Peru but it was also really hard because I was never in one place for more than you know a week or two um and I was thinking during that time a lot about transience and what does it mean to like put down roots and what does it mean to be transient and how how, how can we live with the people we see like as we're passing through? And also what does it mean to really commit to a place? Um, again, I, as a Christian, I was thinking a lot about um, the words of Jesus when he was saying birds of the air have nests, foxes have holes, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And I was thinking a lot about like, what does it mean to be transient, what does that mean for how I want to live my life and how I feel I ought to live my life? And also what does that mean um, for understanding the purpose of being transient? I think a lot of people view transients as like this lifestyle where it's like, oh, like I get to go lots of places and like meet a lot of cool things and do a lot of cool things. And it's all about the experiences. And I think that doesn't necessarily honor the places that you go to. Um, very well. I think that 
I think that viewing a place as like a cool experience for you is not honoring the place or its people very well and is not thinking about how you can love and serve the place where you are um, while you're there. So, so these are some of the thoughts that were running through my head while I was in Peru. And at one point I had gone on a fairly straightforward walk to a market with a couple of friends and I was going to like turn around and walk like the 13 blocks back to the house and they were like going to go on. And one of them turned to me and said, they be us. And was like, do you know where you are? Like, do you know how to get home? Um, and that phrase just has always stuck with me. Um, and when I started thinking about this project and thinking about how we carry place with us and how place shapes who we are really deeply, um, that was the phrase that I kept returning to for these images um, about how I made them. I wanted to flip the standard way we view bodies. So typically you look at a body and you locate it in a landscape. You say, great, this person, like I right now, I'm in a little nook in a house pretty clearly. Um, Jane Jennings right now is in front of a lake, like in front of a beautiful landscape. Um, and I wanted to flip that. I wanted to look at a landscape in the context of the human body and see what would happen with that because we carry the places that have shaped us with us where we go, no matter how far you go. If like I was born and raised, or I wasn't born, but I was raised in Pennsylvania, like no matter where I go, Pennsylvania and the experiences I've had in that place specifically have shaped me and changed how I view the world and understand myself and understand my place in the world and my relationships with it. Um, so I wanted to flip that and take a look at what happened in order to get these images so that there wasn't any projection on the wall behind. I projected, so if the person's like standing here and the projector is pointing towards this wall, I took a camera and pointed it like this way. So I shot them at an angle so you don't see any of the um, projected image on the wall behind. Um, and I kind of rambled there. So I'm going to quickly talk through these. This is my little brother. He's on this call. He, it was really cool to be able to make art with him. I made this over Christmas. Um, yeah, it was really cool to like get to share being creative with my family. So this image means a lot to me. Um, this image is of one of my good friends. Um, and I wanted to try projecting images of a landscape that were meaning that was meaningful for the person. So these are images that I took in Madison. She's lived in Madison for quite a while. Um, so I was projecting images of Madison onto her because I, I wanted to see what that would do. And I wanted to also think about memory and how we carry memory in the body, um, which is something I want to explore in a future project. These are two of my brothers or my only two brothers. Um, this photo is also really meaningful for me be because, um, mainly because they helped me with it. And um, I, I, I love it a lot. <laughs> I think you can see a lot of their personalities and their relationship with each other in this image. Um, one is very strong, very solid. Um, one is younger, maybe a little more tentative, um, but they're both very relaxed. And I think you can see in the space between them where they're so close, but they're not touching um, the intimacy and the ease of their relationship, which, you know, no relationships are always easy, um, but I think they have a really special bond and I feel, I really love this image. I think it speaks really beautifully um, to who they are, both as people. Um, this one, I wanted to think about trees. Trees are this um, deep, meaningful, and kind of constant metaphor for life. Um, so you'll notice there are several trees that I projected um, as we go through the series. Here are two images that are same, same, but different. Um, 
in both of these images, you'll notice there's a tree that goes up along the spine and then there's that bird that's flying off of the shoulder. And I loved the image um, when I took it. I loved, I love both of these and how they interact when they're next to each other. Um, place roots us, place gives us a sense of identity. And that's something that um, we take with us when we leave. And I think that the bird and the tree speak really beautifully to those ideas um, in both of these images. This image is one I took. I fortuitously had a work trip to Hawaii in October, and this image is um, one I took there. I wanted to think about a little bit of, I was toying with the idea of like the female body and fertility and the land. That's also a very ancient idea. Um, and I like this one because it feels very intimate, right? Because like you're close enough that you can see, you can start to see like the hair follicles on the leg that's closest to the camera. Um, but it's also one of those images where you look at it and you kind of have to locate yourself and you have to say, oh, right, I get it. Those are legs. Okay, I know where I am. And for that reason, I like it too. This one, um, again, has that image with the bird and the tree that I really love. Um, but this image is a little more fraught, right? He's looking down, he's in a posture that's like maybe hiding his face, maybe in pain. Um, and our relationship with place is fraught. Our relationship with anything is often difficult or complicated and um, humanity's overall relationship with the earth is difficult. And I wanted to think about that too, where just because you love a place a lot doesn't mean you love it well um, and doesn't mean you treat it well. And it's the same with people. Um, so that's something I wanted to think about too. And this again is of my friend who lives in Madison. Um, the image that I projected onto her was an image of ice on, we have several lakes here, um, and the ice in the middle of the lake had frozen and then ice along the shoreline had frozen and then like crashed together and created kind of this fault line in the ice that I thought was um, quite interesting. So I projected it onto her and then this is one of those shots where she was moving, I was moving, and I just love the way that her hand fits into the shape of her side as she's moving it. Um, and it's not quite natural looking, but it was also really natural. It wasn't posed. It was just something that happened while we were shooting. So it was kind of the natural unnatural. Um, and I really love that. So those are, that's my little talk about the femininity, masculinity, and they would be cast images. Overall, like I, I think these images work together as a series because they explore common themes, right? Common themes of what does it mean to be perceived and to perceive? What does it mean to let those understandings of ourselves and the ways we're shaped by other people and other things, other places? How does that impact who we are and how we move in the world and how we treat other people? Um, and exploring the fault lines and the tensions that come with relationship and with companionship. So thank you all for looking at my work with me. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I really, um... I'll speak for myself. I really, I feel like I have a new understanding of the work that I've been able to look at in person. And, uh, and also I think looking at the images has it, just like showing them up on a screen is also really useful to be able to have an intimate relationship with them.
Um, yeah, I think this is the time that we can start to move into questions as you're starting to think about anything you might want to ask Lindsay about her work. Um, I, I guess I just, I would like to ask a question too. <laughs> um, and I, I just uh, took a lot away from that. I heard you talk about the, um, the overall, how the two series work together, thinking about um, assumptions and also about how we have a relationship with other humans and how we have a relationship with a place. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, that I, that I know that like people see faces in objects and see landscapes as bodies. And there have been some narratives around that and there's humans have that propensity to like see humans in other things, but you kind of did the opposite. And you said like, locate yourself in, you made that the body be sort of obscure and confusing in a way. And the landscape in that, in that Te Ubica series. Um, you made the landscape kind of locate you, you first and then find yourself in the body. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I guess I wanted to know, you spoke a little bit about this, but uh, the images that you chose to project, uh, is there a guiding idea behind them or are, like, is, does, does it relate to the person or what? how did you begin that process of choosing the landscapes that you matched with the people. Yeah, so all the landscapes I projected onto my brothers were actually land pictures of a place they'd never been to. <laughs> I was at home and I was wanting to create. Um, and I had this idea for this project and I had those photos on hand. So I picked out a few of them and then I worked with my brothers and they were like, oh, well, this one's really cool. And I was like, great. So we like tried out a couple of them and it was collaborative and I was like I want to try this one and they were like great we want to try these ones um so those images were just like don't mean a lot to them I don't think <laughs> <laughs> they can speak that that they think otherwise but um then the series with the woman I wanted to be more intentional and start started thinking about the ways the image projected really was something that was meaningful to the person. And ultimately I want to take this and have people bring landscapes that like maybe they've taken or that like are meaningful to them already and then work with those images with those people because I think that will bring a different layer of meaning to the series. Thank you. Thank you. So if you'd like to share a question at this point, you are welcome to write one in the chat and um, we'll make sure that it gets read um, or you're welcome to raise your hand, which I think somebody has done. Um, and you're also welcome to just unmute yourself and chime in, but I'm gonna start with uh, Eric Gordon and I'm gonna ask you to unmute and you've raised a hand so you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, this is Sandra. I'm on his account we're sharing. Um, hi. Um, I think one of the really interesting things that I, I learned um, during this, uh, this conversation you were having is how much like detail and almost drama is involved with like your understanding of who they are as people. And I think like um, when you were speaking of like your brothers, like there's like this additional beauty behind the image that gets told because it's not just posed, you know, like who they are. Um, I guess, can you envision um, that being impacted or like how would that change um, a project if you were to take, you know, people who you don't know as well? Um, like, how do you feel like that dynamic could change or do you think that that would still, you know, remain or, or bring something different? That's a really good question. Um, I typically only work with people that I know well. I, you know, since college, I've mostly shot my friends or people that I that are close to me. Um, so it's a good question. I'm sure it would change the dynamic. Um, I I don't know how because I haven't had a lot of experience with shooting people I don't know very well. But that's a really good question. I think it definitely would change the meaning of the photos, but. It's hard to say how until after they're taken. 
Yeah, thank you. I threw a question in the in the comments, but I'll just ask it if if there's a gap. Um, I mean, I could see you starting out like with a very clear vision and being kind of obsessed about like capturing, you know, very clear statement. But I could also see you like doing a lot of experimentation. What what part experimentation? What part clear vision do you do you start out with and do you move through uh, as you're looking for for the, the, the project that you, that you come up with, the, the, this final, you know, your, your final statement? Yeah, um, it's a lot experimentation. I typically start with an idea um, of like, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I inverted the landscape person, like paradigm? Um, and then it's a lot of like, oh, like as I'm shooting, like, oh, try this, oh, try that. Sometimes I'll sketch out ideas and I'll have a particular, like, I, I want to try like this particular photo and pose. Um, but a lot of it is fairly spontaneous. I love to, I don't want to, you know, detract from the messages you're you're putting out there, but I love the, there's, I, I see at least a, a, uh, like an impressionism too that's kind of layered in there where you're 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 kind of straining to to you know to to see some of these images and see some of these projections and your mind is you know like with with uh with with impressionism your your mind is filling in some of those gaps and you're and you're kind of making sense like the the you know seeing that the hair follicles on the leg along with kind of that blurred uh um projection. Um, I don't know, I just see a lot. I see some impressionism in there too. And I, I, I love that. I think it's super cool. Thank you. Rebecca, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I was struck by the fact that just by using multiple images and, and having them blend on a body, there's an inherent movement and energy to the images. They're, they're they're not still in any sense of the word. They're, they're very uh, three-dimensional and moving. <laughs> not to mention the whole em emotional ev evocations you get from it. Thank you. Rebecca, your hand is raised. Yeah. Um, so Lindsay, on the male-female um, segment, when you were describing it, you were talking about some of the, you know, the, um, you know, the qualities that people, you know, attribute traditionally to men and women, and some of, and and the contrast between those things, and and I and I wonder when you were, did it cross your mind as you were doing this that another way to look at those images are also the individual internal um you know conflicts and competing um emotions especially when you started describing the emotive qualities of the pictures like defensive or um or um proud and some of those things i mean i think we all feel those things and experience those different feelings as individuals and even the male and female components together and we all have aspects of ourselves that are you know both male and female and so looking at these images, I can also see them as reflecting all of the different parts of an individual as well. And did you, did you think about that too, as you were looking at them or compiling them? Yeah, I definitely thought about that. I definitely was thinking both about like generally how we treat each other and then also like my experience and like, what does it mean to be a person who like has both masculine and feminine values and like how those coexist within me and what that's been like. So yeah, that's very perceptive of you. Hey, Lindsay. Hello. Um, I'm just gonna mention this because I think it's maybe reflects of your 
art artistry or even unconsciously the way you've positioned yourself right now in the camera is very interesting you have all these angles and then the reflection of the mirror behind you with another angle in it and then the wall back next to you <laughs> it's very effective you could take a picture of this and it would be very interesting <laughs> this is my favorite place to sit in my whole house because it's like a perfect look <laughs> I love that image that you had, uh, the three images, Lindsay, that you had with the tree and the bird. And, you know, I liked how in the first two images, the tree was like right up the spinal column with the branches almost branching out like where the head, you know, the head is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's sort of like, that's a very grounding type of pose with, the, with that image superimposed in that particular spot. And then the third image, everything seems awry, you know, the tree is off to the side, the bird is flying off the arm. And it's almost like, a, you know, kind of a metaphor for like when you're whole, you know, when you're sort of like when you're not in balance either and, the, and, you're, and your foundation is off, is off kilter and you're that free part of you, the bird part of you is, is escaping or isn't within reach. Um, I, I, when I first saw the pictures um, last week or two weeks ago, I was, I, I was a little bit disturbed by, by them, um, not in a bad way. They were just kind of unsettling, probably because the, you know, the image is so stark against the body. And then when I looked at it again today, and I, it just occurred to me that you know, the placement of the tree and, and the bird and the position of the body, um, it made a lot of sense this, the second go around when I saw it. So I love, I love those three. Those are really beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I, I like how you thought about that I hadn't like put that together about the third image before about how it's all awry but I like that thank you for sharing Rebecca Maggie your hand is raised yeah um I also feel like I just gained a whole new appreciation for these I've talked to them with you extensively before but even even still just hearing you talk about the, the specific images is so um interesting and powerful but um I think one one question I have is um I noticed in the two series one of them um, are in the way they're self-portraits and you model in them in, in whereas in Te Ubicas you are taking pictures of people you know and I just wonder if that changes how you think about the portraits and how you think about the ideas like why is it that you chose to explore a certain idea um, with your own body or was that or does that change how you think about the artwork or do you feel like that was just the way that was most convenient to do it. Like, was there a reason for your, um, your personal involvement, I guess, in the one series versus the other series? Or, or another question might be, what landscape would you project on yourself if you were to model in the Tate Ubicast series? I'll answer the first question first. Um, the Femininity Masculinity series was because I didn't feel like I knew anyone well enough to be like, hey, you want to pose nude for me? <laughs> That feels like a big ask, um, especially because I'd like just moved to Madison and everyone I knew was from work or from church. And that felt like a weird question for anyone from either of those circles. Um, so it, that one was like more convenience. Um, and then the Tewika series, I started doing, like I tried doing it like as self portraits and I was having a really hard time because I like, I'm in a different space, space. Um, I'm in a different apartment than when I took the feminine masculine images and that apartment I had like a really big room and like blank walls and like it was great and it was like kind of like a studio um and in this apartment I have lots of little nooks and crannies which are not super conducive to like finagling projector angles and stuff like that so I, I started off thinking I would take them as a series of self-portraits and then um quickly became frustrated with the limitations of my space and just using me. And it's a lot easier to photograph other people because um, then I can be focused on like focusing the projector and focusing my camera and like arranging the shot while not also having to like move back and forth and then have to refocus because I moved and like blah, blah, blah. So, and I also wanted to like bring in male bodies for it as well. So yeah, a couple of different reasons. And I don't know what la landscape I'd project on myself, but I did project 
the legs um, with the green. That was me. So that is the landscape I have projected. <laughs> Well, I want to give you a chance, Lindsay, also to talk about where you're going next to wrap us up. Maybe you can tell us, um, you mentioned a memory project, and we've talked a little bit about projects you might have on the on the radar for us all to look out for. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, I, I'm hoping to um, do more explorations with the projector and think about memory and how memory like is carried in the body. Um, a project that I'm hoping to do this spring is one that thinks about land ownership. So I want to photograph boundary lines between two properties and then make prints of that and then give the property owners on either side print. And then they can each like take a marker and draw where they think the boundary line is. And then I'm gonna superimpose those two together. Um, and I'm gonna call the name of the shot, um, the name of the people that lived on the land before it was settled. And I want to call it like mine and theirs or like ours and theirs or something to like think about um, our Western ideas of land ownership. And yeah, I'm currently figuring out if I want to go to grad school, I am accepted into a couple of programs. So I'm figuring out if I want to go next year, if I want to go, if, or if I want to defer. Um, so there are a couple of things coming up. Awesome. Those projects sound really cool. And I encourage you all to follow Lindsay if you're not already following her. We'll drop her Instagram in the chat and check out her website. And we will definitely be following you and we're excited to see where you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I am going to also share a couple links about the Multicultural Arts Center. If you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, we would love to be able to share what's upcoming with you or follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Um, we have a show coming into the gallery after Lindsay in May uh, that's called Crick Crack, which is a Haitian call and response term. Um, and it's gonna be a group show of six artists. So we're really excited for that show. So check it out when it comes up. Um, and if you're interested in submitting work or you know somebody else who's interested, we have a rolling call for art. So we're always open to, to submissions and um, especially ones related to our mission. Uh, and Lindsay's years was that in, entire, in its entirety. So we're really thrilled that um, you submitted and that uh, Allison was able to connect us. And we're, um, we're excited to thank you for everyone who could join us and to learn more about Lindsay and to learn about the center. Um, and uh, with that, I think we can say good night. Thanks again, Lindsay. And thank you for all the participants. Um, we're going to have this recording up on our website. So you can check it back or share it with somebody else if anyone wasn't able to join tonight. Good night. Thank you, and thank you, Zoe. Thank you both Thanks, for all the work you've done. No